The one question that I get asked is why were the German fleet in Scarborough Flow after the First World War? Uh, they were there as part of the terms of the armistice. Germany had to surrender eight ships, all the submarines, all aircraft. There was thousands of uh, artillery pieces and railway engines and all that sort of thing was, was taken by the Allies. Uh, supposedly so that the, the Germany couldn't wage war again while the peace talks were going on. And, uh, but they also had to surrender, well not actually surrender, but they, most of the surface fleet, 74 ships, had to be taken into internment and they were to be kept in either an allied port or a neutral port. Neutral port was the preferred option. That was what they were supposed to be looking at, but the Admiralty didn't really, they never really wanted them to go into a neutral port. They wanted them to be held somewhere where they could control them. And Scapa Flow was the most secure naval base. I mean, it was used as the main naval base in both world wars by the Royal Navy. If they had them in the flow, then they could control them. So they arrived here between the 23rd and 27th of November, 1918. And they thought that they were, the crews on board thought they were just going to be a few weeks away from home. But then, you know, the year turns and then it goes to midsummer and they're still sitting there. And the peace talks are not going well. Uh, the German government are refusing to accept the very harsh terms set by mostly coming from France and Britain. And um, it looks like the whole thing is going to break down and there's going to be a state of war again between Britain and Germany. And so Ludwig von Reuter, the rear admiral who was in, in charge of the, the internal squadron, as they called him, um, he was relying on four-day-old copies of the Times newspaper for his information. Uh, none of the Admiralty officers were actually passing information to him directly. So he reckoned that midday, 21st of June, 1919, the peace talks would end and there would be a state of war and his ships would be seized. So that's why he organised the scuttling, uh, which they had to keep quiet from the crew, because a lot of the crews were mutinous. Uh, there was a sailors, a soldiers council on board. So there was a, a kind of communist element, a, a Soviet style government on board the ship by the sailors. Uh, so the officers didn't necessarily have any orders carried out. Some of them actually feared for their lives and there was uh, some justification for that. But Anyway, the, ironically, the letter informing them about Scotland was sent around by British drifters, taking sealed envelopes to the captains of the ships, telling them the plans for Scotland ships. And that um, the morning of the 21st of June, the Royal Navy first battle squadron that was guarding them left Scarborough Floor to go on torpedo exercises in the North Sea, which had been postponed for a couple of days because of bad weather. Uh, and it left the fleet unguarded and it left von Reuter thinking that they were going to go and then come rushing back in and seize the ships, which they had planned to do, but they were going to do it on the 23rd because what von Reuter didn't know was that the armistice had been extended by two days. So, uh, the signal, paragraph 11 confirm, was hoisted around 10.30 or so in the morning. And it's an old student drinking expression in, in Germany, where they were kind of, everything was sort of militaristic, sounding. So paragraph 11 meant keep drinking. So when all the students were drinking, and they thought that it was like, they were slowing up a bit, somebody would say paragraph 11, and then they would start knocking back the beers faster. So keep drinking, which is appropriate because the ships were 
drink in Scapa Flow. And uh, 52 of the 74 ships went to the bottom that day. And uh, others were didn't manage to be scuttled or were beached. But there was complete chaos. Seven German soldiers were shot dead on the day. An eighth died of his wounds uh, the following day. But then Kuno Eversberg was murdered after the peace treaty had been ratified by the German government. And that's a story that you generally don't hear about so much. Eversberg was 19 years old. He was a mechanic on the light cruiser Frankfurt, which was beached in Swanbister Bay and hadn't scuttled. And he was being held with 80 prisoners on board HMS Resolution, the battleship. And it stayed back to work on the salvaging of the battleship Baden, which was also beached next to the Frankfurt in Swanbister. And uh, around five past midnight, he is being escorted with another prisoner by two armed guards to the heads of the ship. So they're going to the toilet, five past midnight, and a shot rings out. And Evers Eversberg is fatally wounded. He's shot through the lower back and up through the abdomen, which pierces his bowels in two places. It passes through his bowels. And uh, despite the best efforts of uh, uh, Dr. Bolton in the hospital ship, um, in the days before antibiotics, he knew that this was a fatal wound. There was no way that they could keep the wound from turning septic. And uh, sure enough, he died on the 29th of tune of peritonitis. So blood poisoning at 9.40 in the morning. Now, the captain had reported this to Admiral, Rear Admiral Fremantle, who was in charge of the first battle squadron. He told the captain of the resolution to hold to um, make investigations. The ship then sailed on the 30th of June to Inver Gordon, and the crew were released uh, on shore leave. And when nothing had happened by the, you know, <clears throat> After a, a while in, in July, you know, he was kind of chivied on to, to come to some sort of conclusion to try to find out the person who had fired the shot. And he just came back saying, no, couldn't find anything, no idea who did it. Um, it was only then that Fremantle reported to his superior officer, Admiral Madden, in charge of the Atlantic and Home Fleet, that the shooting had taken place. And Madden was furious because he's only informed on the 25th of July. So it's a month, you know, it's more than a month after the shooting, which was on the 24th of June. Um, so he was saying, why wasn't I informed? Why haven't you held a court of inquiry? So a court of inquiry was put together, but they again, came up with no evidence, and Madden is furious, so he appoints uh, a senior um, officer to investigate this. Now, when the officer investigates this one, one of the crew, a guy called uh, William Berry, he admits that there was another sailor on board, uh, a guy called James Woolley, had been drunk that night. He'd been on one of the drifters and had got brandy there, which had been traded from one of the German ships. The, uh, the Soviets on board the, the ships, the, the Soldiers' Council, insisted on having large quantities of brandy, which von Reuter was against, but uh, it aggravated a, a really difficult situation. And uh, <clears throat> Woolley was drunk. He was asking where the rifles were kept. He was an officer on the watch, so he already knew where the rifles were kept. And uh, he said he wanted to kill a German because he'd lost two brothers in the war and he wanted to get his own back. And Berry had met him um, 
lying alongside B turret with a rifle, waiting for a German to pass, go into the toilet. And he asked them what he was doing, and he said he was going to get his home back. And he said, well, don't mention my name. So he knew he was going to do it, but he condoned it. And later in court, he said that he did condone the killing. Um, <clears throat> the judge at the trial said that it was, you know, he was lucky that he wasn't in the dock alongside Woody. So they got a name, and they got a, some kind of a, a, a reason for it, a motive. And they, but the problem was that Woolley had been released with all the other sailors and he deserted. He didn't come back to the ship. So they had to search for him and find him. And uh, he was arrested and held as a deserter. But then brought back to Kirkwall, where he, the charges of murder was passed against him. And then he was sent for trial in the High Court in, uh, in Edinburgh. So there was a trial on the 9th of February, 1920. And uh, among the evidence, like I said, Barry had given his piece. He was, he had turned them in to save his own skin because he had turned up just after the shooting. And there was no reason why he should have been on deck. Uh, the reason he gave was that he was watching fireworks ashore celebrating the, uh, celebrating the, the agreement for the peace terms, but to me that seems highly unlikely. I mean, Arcadians never had fireworks. They had bonfires. They liked bonfires for occasions like New Year and uh, you know various kind of important times, Beltane and such like. You'd have bonfires, not fireworks. And also, there was a war had just ended, and uh, you know using gunpowder and fireworks wouldn't have been a thing. So I, I think it's highly unlikely that there would have been fireworks going off at the back of midnight in Scapa Flow, um, unless it was just people on the fleet setting off flares, very lights or something, which again would be unlikely because you get into trouble for that. But anyway, his reason for being on deck, rather than being in his bunk, was pretty tenuous. And uh, suspicion was against him, so then he drops Woolly in the frame. Uh, Woolly's father says that he's a good boy, he doesn't drink, uh, although he was drunk that night. And there was a professor from Edinburgh uh, who said that he'd done a psychological profile on him and he thought that he had a flattened area on his skull, which was caused by being struck by a stone when he was a boy, and he thought it might have left him with some mental health issues and that alcohol would have aggravated it. Um, this evidence was dismissed as irrelevant by the Navy later after the, the trial. They didn't believe it, but the jury did, and there was a, a verdict of not proven which in Scots law, not proven, uh, is a third alternative from guilty or not guilty. Not proven means that there's insufficient evidence or there's sufficient doubt to make a conviction insecure. But at that time, what British court is going to convict a British sailor of shooting a German sailor after that bloody and bitter war where everybody would have lost somebody? Uh, the chances of a chairman receiving justice, highly unlikely. And also if the bear in mind death penalty for murder was, was the, the, the usual uh, outcome. So there was cheers in the court. All the other sailors went over and congratulated him and slapped him on the back. He'd burst into tears. Everybody was cheering. It was an absolute travesty, really. But... The Admiralty um, issued letters of reprimand to uh, Captain Allington of the Resolution for not dealing with the shooting properly, not investigating it thoroughly. Um, also, Rear Admiral Fremantle also received a reprimand for not informing his commanding officer. Um, not ordering a court of inquiry, 
But there was another reason as well. Uh, he was asked by the Admiralty to supply a list of names of Germans killed during the Scotland at a request from the German government wanting to know, you know, which of their nationals had been killed. And he gave them a list of eight names, he said, of Germans buried at the Naval Cemetery in Linus. And among the list of the dead was Kuno Eversberg. And he wrote that on the 29th of June, the day that Eversberg died. He died at 9.40 in the morning. He wrote this at 25 past five in the afternoon. Um, there was one more casualty that wasn't mentioned because there was a chairman who was killed on the day of the Scotland, on the 21st of June. But his body was never recovered. So he wasn't buried at Linus. He just gave a list of the people buried at Linus. Kuno Eversberg wasn't buried at Linus. His body was lying in a floating mortuary off Linus. And he wasn't buried until the 2nd of July. The fact that he had knowingly given false information uh, was another reason for being reprimanded. Uh, the First Lord of the Admiralty had suggested that he shouldn't um, he should be informed that he wasn't to expect to uh, advance any further in the Navy or hold any important rank. But this was later pointed out to him that he's a Vice Admiral and he's in charge of the 1st Battle Squadron. He already holds a high rank in the Admiralty. And if you say that he's unfit to hold a high rank and he's already holding a high rank, that reflects badly on the Admiralty. So uh, it was rather swept under the carpet in a way. They had to express their displeasure, but that was it. Really. But the fact that he had said that Kuno Eversberg died on the 21st of June meant that Kuno Eversberg's gravestone had died 21st of June, carved on it. And it was a local uh, diver and historian here, Kevin Heath, that did a tremendous amount of work researching this and actually got Eversberg's death certificate, a copy of it, uh, which was passed to the Commonwealth War Grave Commission. And they changed the date on the stone to the 29th of June, in time for the centenary on the 21st of June, 2019. Um, they didn't replace the stone because they couldn't find a stone that was the same colour as the other one. So they skimmed it, they, they cut the stone down thinner and then carved the, the name and the, the correct date in it. But Woolley that killed them, he was dismissed from the Navy, but he disappears from history after that point. When you think that uh, you know, all those hundreds of thousands of men that had died from Britain in World War I and who had come back maimed and horribly wounded. The death of one German sailor was a drop in the ocean to that. So people wouldn't have been, you know, it wouldn't have been a story that would have caught the public imagination. They would have probably said, oh good, he got off. But they wouldn't have thought this is a travesty, this is, you know, this is unjust because there's a lot of evidence against this guy. Barry could have been held as an accomplice because he knew what was happening and hung around to watch as well. I mean, that's why he was there. He was waiting to see whether he got one, um, by which I mean whether he managed to kill a German. And uh, so... Once that story had broken, it was certainly in the Scottish newspapers, it's in the Scotsman, Harry or something. But I mean, then it just kind of wasn't a, wasn't a story anymore. So uh, <clears throat> there wasn't any kind of you know like court of appeal or anything like that. It was just that's the verdict. That's it. 
We haven't admonished you, but we haven't convicted you either. The sad thing is we have no idea about anything about Puno Eversberger's family. We don't know where he came from. Um, don't know whether he had brothers or sisters, you know, parents, we have absolutely no idea about them. And there is no records in the files in queue relating to his family being contacted. It would all been done through the German ambassador. So it was never involved with the family. It was all done through bureaucrats and, and politicians. Um, so we know absolutely nothing about them at all. Uh, and we don't have a photograph of them. There's one scan of Woolly in the Dock taken from a newspaper which was passed to me by Nick Jellicoe. Um, and that's it. We don't have any other images of him and we have no images of Kuno Eversberg. Which is really sad because I'd love to see the face, you know, the man behind the murder, you know. I mean, he's remembered because of the way he died. But there would have been a lot more to him than that, of course. Uh, but the real tragedy was that he was 19 years old as well, and Eversberg was 19. You know, it was teenagers killing teenagers. Really sad.